Hey, welcome back. Now that we've covered the foundations of IP and subnetting, let's take a quick detour and talk about routing and how routers work. So if you can, if you're in Windows or Linux or Mac, go ahead and open up your, your command prompt or your terminal and I want you to display the IP address configurations of your computer. Now I'm going to show you mine. That's fine. I'm in my lab. But uh, I want you to do it on your computer as well. So follow along. So I'm going to type IP config on Windows uh, forward slash all. If you're on Linux, you can do IP space add or IF config. Um, and it'll, it should show your, your same settings here. Now what I'm looking for here, since we're talking about routing, and I want to ask you, is which of these are addresses that I'm looking at in front of me right here is the router's IP address? I'll give you some time, pause the video, think about that. I'll tell you now that that is the default gateway. Do you know what a default gateway is? The default gateway is the IP address of the router that is servicing that subnet. Meaning, for any device that needs to send traffic to a machine on this, the, a different network, so a network other than the one it's on, it will need to send to the default gateway. Let me show you this in more depth. In Windows, what you can do is you can type netstat dash r and this will actually show you windows routing table so yes one of the key characteristics of a router is it has a routing table but know that so do operating systems operating systems in some ways are routers right like so you could technically say windows is doing a little bit of routing because, and why do I say that? It has a routing table. Now, are routing protocols running and all that? Well, we'll talk about that later. But in this case, you see the IPv4 route table for my Windows 11 machine. If you look at the first route here, I want to explain this a little bit. This first route is telling my, com it's telling my computer where to send traffic if it doesn't know where to send it. So this is what in the Cisco world they call this the gateway of last resort. But across operating systems and just in TCP IP in general, this is going to be your default gateway. And here's one of the interesting things about this and I will break down this routing table syntax if you will or the structure here. Now the network destination you'll notice here is all zeros. Does anybody know what that means? That means any uh, network, the net mask or the subnet mask, any. The gateway, that is the gateway out of the network. In other words, the IP address of the router. And then of course, this is the, what's called the exit interface, meaning out of what interface will the traffic you know, be sent out of before it gets here, right? So what I really want you to get from that is that your operating system, it does some routing. And that default gateway IP address is the IP address of your router. And where did it come from? We talked about this in a, lot, in a prior video. That default gateway assignment came from DHCP. So whether this, that's just a standalone DHCP server or your router is acting as a DHCP server because it's very common, especially in the small, medium-sized networks, for the default gateway to be assigned, or the, I'm sorry, for the DHCP server to be on the router. Now, in the bigger companies, typically DHCP is going to be on its own server, uh, like a Windows server or something. Um, but... Yeah, so that's hopefully that makes sense. Leave a comment below if you've got any additional insight uh, and, let, and let me know what you think on that. So let, let's get into a little bit more depth here. And I'm going to I'm going to grab a router that I've got here just to show you physically your router IP address where it can be sometimes. So 
This is an older Cisco router. This is an 1841, but it's going to serve a good purpose here as we talk about where is where is that IP address assigned on a router. So if it's in a bigger or medium sized to bigger company, you're typically going to have a dedicated router that's sitting between, you know, your company and the the internet service provider. And your default gateway is going to be one of these network interfaces. So when you hear, you know, I, I would like you at this point in, in the course to try to try to force yourself to start using the terminology interface instead of port. Because as we go and as we look at how applications network are networked, you'll see that the term port is also used to explain like a logical port assigned to an application. For example, like a web a web application would be like port 80. So when you think about default gateways and IP addressing, try to call these interfaces. And I only say that because it can get confusing when you use the term port. And trust me, you're going to hear me call switch ports ports all the time. I'm not calling them switch interfaces. But with routers, I try to be very intentional about calling these interfaces. So each each of these interfaces right here, they can have an IP address. And I'll, technically, you can create what's called virtual interfaces on these. But for now, just know that these, are, these physical interfaces here, for example, you can see here with F00 or FE, Fast Ethernet 00, it can be assigned an IP address. So you could go in there and you could give it 10388.1 and in the network scheme of things everything is flowing through the switch and going to the router right and for example when we think physically how everything's networked go back to our topologies you know the the devices will have a cable that runs and it connects to um, a switch and then that switch may have a connection that runs back to a router and the way that the traffic physically gets there is through, you know, the switch, the cable, the switch and the cable or whatever to the router. But logically, the way it figures out that it needs to get there is through, you know, the what we what we were looking at, right? In the routing table. So on a router itself, the routing table looks a lot like this. And when the router receives traffic um, from, from a device, it looks at the header, it looks at the source IP address, and it looks at the destination IP address, and it decides, it looks at its routes, and it decides which, uh, which direction, which IP address, which interface it needs to send that traffic to. So let's go ahead and... Let's get into this in Packet Tracer because I do want you to be able to see how how traffic routes from one location to another, and I, I want you to follow along. And and we'll get we'll do it physically as well. So, uh, but we'll, we'll that'll be a separate video. So, all right. So go ahead and open up Packet Tracer. That's what I'm doing now. Now that we're in Packet Tracer. We can go ahead and put some routers into the put one router into the topology and two switches. This will be similar to a topology that was mentioned in the last video or a, a, a prior video. And you'll notice I'm zooming in and stuff. And what we're gonna do is we're going to set up two different networks. And in these two different networks, we're going to have one PC each. And I want us to get to the point where we can have one PC that's in a completely different network pinging the other PC through the router. So we'll be able to ping and we'll be able to see what the router is doing and how the router works. Cool. And then we'll get into some more in-depth routing as well. 
So remember what I said earlier about, and I showed you the router and the interface. Well, in Packet Tracer, you know, they they simulate all that. So when you look at, you hover over any of these lights, and these are supposed to be the link lights, you'll see the identifier of that NIC, that network interface. And on this one, you'll see that this is G00. So we're going to hop on this router, and I'm going to give you a little crash course on iOS, Cisco iOS. But I just want you to know for now that, you know, your your router, your interfaces on a, you know, enterprise-grade router are going to have identifiers, right? So this one's G00. The one on the router I showed you earlier was FE00 or FE01. And so that's where we're going to assign our IP addresses for each network. So let's say this network is 192.168.0.0 with a 24-bit, you know, subnet mask. And this network is 172.16.0.0 with a 24-bit subnet mask. These two networks are in different, these are different networks entirely. Um, logically, and because they're physically separated. But the main thing here when we talk about routing is logical separation, right? And that is through IP addressing. So, and, and with this, we can see that, of course, these switches connected physically to a different interface. But um, I want you to know that this whole routing thing is typically a logical world of thought. It's a logical way of thinking about dividing up what's called broadcast domains. Because one of the terms when you start studying, you know, in depth with Cisco, if you, if you ever go for your CCNA, or your net plus, you're going to come across this terminology that focuses on um, collision domains and broadcast domains. So in short, and this is how I look at it, this is how it's often defined, is a broadcast domain is this the segment of a network where broadcast will occur, right? So for example, with 192.168.0.0, in IP addressing, we know there's two addresses that are reserved, right? Or there's two addresses that we can't use, right? And that is the network address, which summarizes the entire network. And then there's the broadcast address, which is an ad address that applications will use to send broadcasts out. Because we know still to this day in 2023, there are applications that use broadcast to discover other instances of that application on the network. So know that anytime that type of traffic will get generated, it's going to it's going to make sure a packet is generated that the destination IP address is the broadcast address of a network. I say all this because what should not be happening when you have a router here is broadcast messages in this network should not be getting forwarded to this subnet uh and why why well because because security right that's one reason because performance performance i mean what if what if that's how it worked now what if like your network that i'm that you're on at your house right now where or at work right now was sending broadcasts and those broadcasts were reaching every other network in the entire world over the internet the internet would be at a crawl or just stopped, you know, because there would be so many broadcasts to, to, um, to process, right? So it's like, it makes sense to, to, to isolate that. So one of the things that you'll see is that routers isolate broadcast domains, um, so that, and, and you can, I'll say this, and that's beyond the scope of this, this video, but routers can forward broadcast but they have to be explicitly told what to broad what to forward so uh, by default out of the box routers are not going to forward broadcast from two different network segments to one another um, they are going to route traffic between but they're not going to route broadcast generally so um that's an important detail 
you'll see that on certification exams, several certification exams. But if you think about it from a security perspective, would you want to be able to, anybody to be able to open up a network discovery tool like uh, maybe Advanced IP Scanner and Nmap can do network discovery as well. And would you want somebody to be able to scan on their, start a scan on their network and it reaches yours on your internal network? No. And one of the things that does prevent that, in addition to a plethora of other security controls, is routers, just separating things by broadcast domain. And we'll talk about NAT and all that later. But for now, let's jump into, I, I do go on some educational rants. I hope those rants help and don't distract from the main point. So when we go into this router, what I'm going to do is I'm going the goal is to give an IP address to this interface G00 and to give an IP address to G01. Uh, but before we do that, I I have to give you a quick rundown of iOS. I just feel like it wouldn't be it wouldn't be nice of me to just jump into configuring without showing you. So I'm clicking the device itself. And I'll show you how to really do this in the real world in the next video. But for now, just know I click in this device. I go to CLI, which is command line interface. And I'm in the command line interface of Cisco iOS. What is Cisco iOS? I'm so glad you asked. It is Cisco's inter-network operating system. And it is that. It's an operating system that, oh, thanks for the follow. It is an operating system that runs on routers. It runs on switches uh, that Cisco makes. It's Cisco's, usually they're making what's called managed devices, meaning they have full-blown operating systems on them that you can configure and you can secure and you have more control over how to monitor them. Whereas I, I would grab it, but it's not near me, but I have like a Netgear 8 port switch that's unmanaged, meaning it doesn't have an operating system. It has firmware not an operating system. It is a switch, but it's not configurable. So when we look at Cisco iOS, I'm typically going to say at this screen, no, I, d I don't want to enter initial uh, configuration dialog because I want to, I want to do, I want to do me, man. I want to just, you know, configure it from scratch. But what I want to show you, see if can we zoom in? Oh no, we can't. So you see in the bottom left corner of the screen right there, it says router greater than sign, I want you to know that that's, that's an indicator that you are in user exec mode or user executive mode is what Cisco calls it. This right here is the host name. This is the prompt that indicates the mode you're in. There's not a whole lot you can do in user exec, but if you wanted to figure out what commands you have at your disposal, you can do the question mark. The fact that I do that is like help. That's what most operating systems have, a help feature. Cisco's cool because it has what's called context-sensitive help. So I could start typing commands like show, and I could do space question mark, and it will show me, based on the context of the show command, what else can I do, if that makes sense. So... Um, that beyond that, I'm just going to show you there's so many commands in Cisco that it's like, I'm not sure there's anybody on earth other, other than maybe the creators of Cisco iOS that actually know um, every single command. So just just breathe easy knowing that you don't need to know every command. Um, Cisco with the CCNA and with, with other um, certs, they do want you to know quite a bit. And it, yes, uh, CLI is the way to learn, especially if you're doing um, the certificates, any of the Cisco certs. But I will say, like, it does help you breeze through configurations if you understand it. And it's like if a mechanic, it's like, you know, a mechanic, when they flip open the hood and they see the engine, they can see everything in there. You know, it's like, you know, you know, to me, command line is like driving a stick. You kind of know how it runs a little better. When you do that, then just a GUI. But I'm also a GUI person. I will also use GUIs. With Cisco devices, I like CLI. So all that to say, let's go to the next mode. So we're going from user exec mode 
to privileged exec mode. How do you do that? You type en or you type the whole command, which is enable. Notice how the prompt changes from a greater than sign to a pound sign or hashtag, whatever you want to call that. I could have also just done en. You can shorten commands in Cisco iOS. makes things easier. So as you do things multiple times and as you practice, you'll, you'll see and you watch different videos on YouTube or wherever, you'll see um, people type commands in a shortened way that you're like, hey, I never thought about shortening that command that way. That was cool. I'm going to do that now. And you'll adopt it. So, But it is important, I think, to know the full command. Because uh, I seem to recall, I will say, having questions on certification exams that um, that was an expectation of just knowing what the command was. Uh, so, yeah, enable gets me to privilege exec. Privilege executive mode has a lot more to it. Like it gives you more privileges, right? You know, I can tell you there are Fortune 500 companies that you know, you, you need to pass a test internally before they will give you enable privileges or because you can set a password on the enable command so that you, you know, you can only get to enable by typing a password. Um, or you can even create user accounts with a certain level of privileges that only gives you the ability to run certain commands and get to certain modes, if that makes sense. So there, there is some user access control on Cisco iOS as well. And you can integrate with um, identity services like Active Directory. So um, the ultimate mode, the mode to rule them all on um, Cisco is typically what's called global configuration mode. So you type configure terminal. And I barely ever type the whole command. So I hit enter. Um, I usually type C-O-N-F space T, which confs, comp T, short for configure terminal. Um, if you want to go back down a mode, you can type exit, and it'll put you back down a mode. So I can do comp T, practice that. So I recommend, you know, I just showed you that. If that's the first time you're seeing that, practice that. Practice going from user exec to privilege exec to global config. Because the way you remember commands uh, is you just do them. And uh, it's not like, I can't say that with Cisco iOS that I like popped open, um, you know, I popped open a command cheat sheet and I just studied it all night <laughs> or I studied it for weeks at a time and I was just doing drills or whatever. It's like, and that's how I remember, no, that's not how I remembered it. I remembered a lot of these by just doing them. And a lot of the times what I'm doing now, explaining them, that's how I kind of got ingrained in my head. And occasionally I, I forget stuff and I do question mark. And I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that command. Or hey, I didn't know you could do that. So I'm in global config mode. Remember what the original goal was before I did this little crash course on iOS commands? And that was to, show, to assign IP addresses to the interfaces on the router. We're going to do that. Uh, I also like to show you just that you can do host name. So... Hostname R1 changes the hostname. So um, the next thing I'm going to do is go into the actual interface of the router and I'm going to assign it an IP address. So just going over here to remember which one it, it is. I'm going to hover over, click here, hover over, G00 it was, and I'm scrolling down. And I will type this. So I'll type int which is short for interface, G0 forward slash zero. Now, I'm never going to type out gigabit ethernet, okay? When I know you can do G0, zero, never will I type out, you know. If I know you can do int instead of interface, I'm typing int. So hit enter. Notice how the prompt changes to config if. I'm in the interface configuration mode, and I can change... I can assign the IP address. I can turn the interface on, all types of stuff. So let's do that. I'm going to do IP space add, which you know what that's short for, IP address. Type 192.168.0.1 space 255.255.255.0. Yes, you do have to type out the subnet mask. 
hit enter and I'm gonna type no shut which is short for no shutdown the logic here is weird out of the box these routers have a command on each interface that is shut down meaning they are in the state of shut down so when we do no shutdown we're remote we're essentially like removing shutdown command from that interface configuration and it turns it on you'll notice if you look in the top left the light went from red to green or amber or whatever you know amber is like you know it's the, the lights on a port's link light mean or a, an interface's link lights mean something that's a different video in itself but they mean something like from a functional standpoint um and um so they're up this this interface is up and let me show you my thinking and how I do this as I'm testing. I will go to my that my PC. I'm going to give my PC an IP address too, and I'm going to see first if I can ping that interface. So I'll go to desktop, 192.168.0.10. It's going to autofill because it's classful or whatever. So if I do a class C IP scheme, it will automatically autofill and try to do a class C subnet mask. That's that's usually helpful, not always. Sometimes you want to do different subnet masks and it tries to assume. But default gateway, what are we going to put here? Uh, let me know in the in the chat. Let me know in the comments. We're putting what we just assigned, right? 192.168.0.1. Boom. I got a default gateway assigned. What if, here's a question. What if I did everything right? except for assigning this right here so what if i did everything right and it's just all, all good but i didn't make sure my computers got a default gateway if yeah someone said no network the what would actually happen is this device could reach anything else on its lan right it could ping you know, the server over here, if there was a server or the access point over here, whatever else was on the LAN in its 192.168.0 subnet, right? Because that's the subnet it's in. But it could not get outside. And what's funny is even if the router was set up right, the IP address was configured, the routes were there, the PC has to have a default gateway because when when you look at the ip address so when you look at what i want to when you can i'm sorry when you consider where a computer is sending traffic it will look at the destination ip address and if that destination if it determines that destination ip address is not is not in uh this network it, it's automatically programmed to look and see if it has a default gateway. And if it doesn't, what do you think it does with that packet? I'll, I'll give you some time. Comment below or in the chat. And I'll, I'll tell you what it does. It will discard it. And the message you'll get is, you know, destination host unreachable. And that reply will, def, will, will typically come from your computer so the computer you know when you look at these ping messages and stuff look at where the source is because if the source is from yourself that means it never left right but what if you got like a destination host unreachable and it came from the ip address of the router that tells you something different right it tells you okay maybe the router just can't get there so it's you know these are some things that matter within the and just networking in general no matter what your discipline is so these are all important things. So yeah, we could we could absolutely do that. Someone someone suggested to uh let's let's like misconfigure this. So the first thing what we'll do here is we'll we'll show that it we'll show it work and then we'll break it on purpose to see what happens if it's not there. So or if it's misconfigured. So one nine two one six eight zero dot one um, I want to ping that too. So here's the funny thing too. Another thing to understand, just one of the details is if I have a default gateway assigned 
in my host, yet it's not existent on the network or there's a hardware issue or no cable there, that's not going to do me any good, right? Because it can't reach it. So, yeah, just keep that in mind. So that's why I like to ping as I go when I'm configuring stuff. I'm very meticulous. Sometimes it might take me longer than the average person to set it up, but it's because I want to save time in the planning. What is it, the five P's? Proper planning prevents poor performance. I've mentioned that before. It's like if you do all this stuff in the beginning, you don't have to troubleshoot an issue you made later. Because ask me how I know that. I've done it before. So I'm getting replies. So cool. How do I know these are successful replies again? Because look at this ping statistics. The statistics um, are four sent, four received, zero loss, right? Boom, that's what we want. So I know there's not an issue going from here to here. You're going to thank me for encouraging you to do that type of stuff when in the future we start doing VLANs and we're doing routing between VLANs and it gets more complicated right here at what many would consider the layer two of the OSI model or whatever is you know, at the switch level, it gets really complicated. There's a lot of protocols that happen here in an enterprise environment that you wouldn't otherwise think, like spanning tree protocol, you know, routing, or not routing. Well, yeah, I guess sometimes routing, um, but that would be layer three as well. Yes, you can route on a switch, on, on some switches that can do that, um, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um but yeah, when VLANs get involved on switches, that's when you start to really realize, okay, I need to start testing stuff as I go to make sure it works. And then documentation is important too. So we've we can ping our we can ping this network's default gateway. And if this was me in real life, and I'll do a whole entire I guess I'll do a whole video in the real life walkthrough of this, is I've got my laptop, I'm the network person building it for the first time. I'm connecting to that switch with my laptop, got cables and everything, and I'm testing everything before I tell whoever I, you know, whoever the department head, whatever, wherever I work, before I tell them, okay, the network's ready. To me, I like to test first. I'm not, I'm not using the, the users as uh, guinea pigs to test a network that should be working already. Not usually. Usually I'll try to test it first, then I'll send the email or whatever. Hey, everything's back up. Maintenance is done. We're good to go, right? So, boom, we've got that configured. How about the next the next network, right? So I'm hovering over this again just to see G01. You do int G01. Then do IP add, let's do 172.16.0.1.255.255.255.0. Enter no shut. Remember no shut is removing shut from the configurations that's already there. So hit enter and it's coming up. In, in Package Tracer you can fast forward time. In real life, you know, sometimes you wish you could. But then you end up like Adam Sandler in... Um, What's it called? Click. So, um, I think that's what the movie's called, right? So then, well, let's go assign the IP address here. I'm doing 172.16.0.10. I'm going to give it a class C subnet mask, which is 255.255.255.0. And then default gateway, we're going to do 172.16.0.1. This is the, the time we're going to make sure it works first. And then after, we'll, we'll break it. So let's try to ping. So I'm going here, ping 172.16.0.1. I'm pinging. Great job. So I can ping my gateway, and the PC can ping, the PC on this side can ping its gateway. Should these two computers be able to communicate with each other? Let me know in the comments, let me know in the chat. I know the answer. I just want to see if you do. They should be theoretically right because we've got we've got this IP address assigned. We've got this IP address assigned. These can communicate, and 
And let's. this is when we're going to look at what's called the routing table. The routing table is very important. So to look at your routing table in um, Cisco iOS, uh, from global configuration mode, you can do do show IP route. If I was in privilege exec mode, I would do show IP route. But since I'm in a global config, which is a higher mode, I I can do show commands by typing do first. So hit enter, and let's look at this in full screen. So the routing table, this is a core skill in networking to know. Uh, maybe maybe a core knowledge is to understand how does a routing table work. Earlier we looked at the host space routing table, right? We looked at how does a routing table work on a host. It works the same way on a router. So here's at what Cisco's routing table looks like. And I want to show you why I knew, intuitively I knew why those PCs should be able to ping each other is because they are directly, those those networks are directly connected through the same router. What does directly connected mean? Because it's telling me this here too, right? In the routing table, it's telling me they're directly connected. Well, this, the physical cable is directly connected to the same router. Now, it would not be directly connected if this PC was connected to a switch that had a connection to a completely separate router. That's when I would need a routing protocol, and routing protocols will come later. Uh, I'll talk about them later. But for now, just know these are directly connected networks. And how do I know that? Uh, because of the definition and because of just seeing this in the routing table. How do you read a routing table, though? You need to be pretty fluent in routing tables if you're going to do networking stuff, especially at an enterprise level or where there are, you know, multiple subnets. And in this case, I'm talking about subnets, right? So this is a this is a network. This is a subnet. And this is a subnet. Uh, these are two different logical networks. Therefore, we need a router to for one to reach the other. So when I look at the routing table, this is how I read it. From the top down, it's like a map. Think about it as a map. And from the top down, you see these codes tell you how to read the map. So you see L is local, C is connected, and I won't read all of them because you can you can read as well. I'm sure of it. Is uh, all these different codes explain how that route was learned? Because what this is right here, this is a just all the routes that my router knows about. This is, if you're going here to one of these places, my router knows how to help you out. It knows how to help you get there. This is this is what this is here. So these, these routes, th looking at this, this is where if I'm having issues reaching other networks and I, I think it's on the router, I'm looking at the routing table first because... And the IP, of course, I'm looking at IP address assignment as well. But I'm also going to look at route the routes. Is that route is the route to that network there? So I can ask you this question: Is okay? Let's say my let's say I've got a bunch of computers in one network, and one of the computers is has an IP address that's one seven two sixteen zero dot twenty. Could my router get traffic to that network based on the routing table that you're looking at right here? Let me know. Yes, it can. How do I know that? Because this network is known. It learned about this network. So let's look at how each how to read each entry. So if I'm looking at this, this is a directly connected, right? This network. And this is the network, right? This 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 zero is the network address dot zero. This is the subnet mask. It is directly connected, and it's learned the network through this interface G zero one. The L or local is the local IP address. It learned it through, which is the IP address we assigned to that interface. Right, that thirty two bit subnet mask is just telling us. Basically, it's telling us this is just a this is a statically assigned IP address. 
It's not an entire, this isn't an entire network. This is the IP address that was assigned to that gateway. And then, you know, this is where it's assigned. Same here with 192.168.0.0 network. It's directly connected. It's learned about this network. The router itself has learned about this network through this gateway or through this um, interface. And the local connection is 192.168.0.1. Remember that 32 bits is just saying this is a statically assigned address, uh, essentially. is directly connected, and there we go, right? So that's how you read it. Now, this is what will prove me wrong or right, is can it ping? Can we ping? Let's try to ping from this PC to the other PC. So I'll look at my IP because I forgot it. 172.16.0.10, maybe I'll copy that just to make it quicker, and ping that from here. So ping, paste, enter, and it reached there. Cool. So we are routing right now. My PC looks at its default gateway because, you know, it's when it, well, let me just explain this real quick and then we'll break it. So ping, I pinged 172.16.0.10 and pretty immediately my PC determined that's not in my network. So it's not my problem. I'm sending it to the default gateway. It know, it, it might know. Because, you know, my PC right really doesn't know if my router knows how to get there. That's the router's job. So it gets there. The packet flows there. And then the router looks at it. It does this thing called anding. I think most devices do anding, which is comparing a you know the binary of an IP address to the binary of the subnet mask and it determines if it's in the same network the router will do that and it'll determine it'll look at its routing table and it'll say hey uh do I have you know and I just think I just make I imagine like a human like thing saying hey do I have this route inside of my routing table or do can do I know how to get to 172.16.0.0 oh I do and then it will route that traffic and send it on its way. Now, let's 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 break something. So now that we've done that, let's break this. What if, for example, 17216 didn't know its default gateway? Let's do that. So let's I'm gonna put 15. I'm purposefully breaking this configuration or misconfiguring this to see what what happens right so let's go back over here and let's try to ping because right we didn't break anything on this side this pc ha let's think theoretically right now you could pause the video or mute me whatever you need to do to to challenge yourself how far will this traffic get will it reach the router will it how far will it get to the pc how far will it get so one way we can check that is by pinging again, right? So I could, you know, press up because, you know, why not? Press enter. Notice I'm not getting the reply anymore. Let's see where the reply comes from or if I get a reply from somewhere. So it says request timed out. How far did it go? Where did it go? We can, excuse me, cracked my neck there. So... I'm getting time now. I can tell you what's happening, and if you wanted, we could flip over to simulation mode in Packet Tracer, which is behind my behind me. Um, you can flip over to simulation mode and simulate this as well. So I, I'll um, I'll just show I'll move myself, and you can do edit and clear clear all of it by pressing this right here. And go to ICMP because when you ping or you use trace route, it's actually generating an ICMP packet. And close out of that, and we can try to do that again. And this time we can actually see the packet. This is what I like about I really like this about Packet Tracer. And you can skip to the next step. See and see how far the ping actually got. Look, look, it got into that network. It reached the PC, died there. Remember what we said earlier about I uh, about a 
PC without a default gateway or without a working one, that the that PC it do, it discards the packet because it doesn't know what to do with it, right? It's not just going to try to continue to process something it doesn't know what to do with, right? So that's why that didn't work. So if we fix that, it'll of course reply. So yes, I hope this has been an interesting lesson for you. In the next video, we're going to do this, at least parts of this, in real life. So I will see you then.